the rest of the mass, that's when all the faithful are sent out. And I know, you know, maybe over the last 20 years there's a habit, I don't know if it's still prevalent in, in all the Catholic churches, we don't do it here, where, where people who are going through RCIA would leave as a group at, at the end of the first half of the mass and go have some separate instruction that was only, if I remember right, after they were baptized into the church that they were able to stay for the whole mass, which is kind of recalling that, that original sensibility of the mass of the catechumens and the mass of the faithful. All right, so we have the first part that's going to resemble, um, it'll be resembling the <laughs> first half of the mass of the Thomas, but it'll resemble the synagogue. Um, let's see, okay, here's the first thing, everybody knows all this stuff, but still, usually the kids haven't gone over in a lot of detail. Of course, the first thing we do is have a greeting, and we sing a hymn, and then, and, and of course, the priest says, you know, the Lord be with you, and we sing with your spirits. It's like, hi, how you doing? We're doing fine, and we all love God, so we're all here together. And right off the bat, I love it, the first thing we do in the Catholic Church is collectively acknowledge our sins. Because if we weren't sinners, we wouldn't need to be there. And y'all know the whole thing. And um, I think this ties in very nicely to, to James's epistle saying you have to con you confess your sins to one another. We say you confess to Almighty God and to you, my brothers and sisters. You know, this, the, this phrasing is being, I think, carefully pulled out of the Bible into, the, into these prayers in the Catholic Mass. It's not accidental. I'm confessing to you, my brothers and sisters, that I've greatly sinned. And we go on down and says, Therefore I ask, Blessed Mary, ever virgin, all the angels and saints, and you, my brothers and sisters, to pray for me to the Lord our God. And I love it because this is like the classic example of Mary. Is everybody saying, we're not worshiping Mary. We're asking Mary to pray for us. I would ask you to pray for us. Are you a miserable sinner? Yes, you are. Would I ask you to pray for me anyway? Yes, I would. Would I rather have somebody who's a saint up in heaven pray for me? Hell yeah. So there's, so there's another one that, that, that's perfectly reasonable. And by the way, um, in, my, in, my, in my daddy's old... Um, uh, I guess it was Tridentine Missile, as part of the confidi art was saying, and I ask um, St. Michael the Archangel, yes. and I ask St. John the Baptist. It was just great, these other people getting pulled into because of the roles that they play, you know, in forgiveness and fighting the devil and all this kind of stuff. Oh, in fact, that reminds me, is um, yesterday, I was, yesterday I was reading something about the Greek, the Greek crisis in the paper. Or somewhere. I think it was the newspaper. Then again, maybe it wasn't. And they, they were interviewing a Greek man, and this was actually his name. I had no idea that, that people actually had this as a given name in Greek. Prodromos was the guy's name, which is which is how what the Greeks how the Greeks entitled John the Baptist. They don't really call him, they can call him John the Baptist, but that's not the big deal to them. They call him Ioannis prodromos, and pro means uh, first or in front. No, it means, it means in front, okay, front. And dromos is like, you might know what a hippodrome is. Yeah. Okay, what is it? It's a bicycle, or a circle. Yeah, for what? Motorcycles. Yeah, and what was it originally? Anybody know, anybody know what hippo means? Huh? Like hippopotamus? Oh, fun, 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 fun. Okay, here we go, hippopotamus. Uh, let's see what we know, because the same thing with kids, you know more Greek than you think. Um, what was, what, what, what's the place that was between the Tigris and Euphrates? Mesopotamia. Yeah, you know, Mes you know what Mesopotamia means in Greek? Probably somebody does. The kids know. Somebody the kids will know. Meso means between. Potamia means between the rivers. Mesopotamia, between the rivers. And so potamus and hippopotamus means river. And hippo means horse. So a uh, hippopotamus is a river horse. All right. Having having labored through that, now we get to <laughs> now we get to hippodrome, um, and we also get to a dromedary. Y'all remember the dromedary camels? Yeah. Okay. There. Um, all right. We know the hippo means horse, and it's it's a, it's some kind of a round the curve. It's some kind of place. You might want to guess now what dromos means. We may not get it. It's okay. It means to run. Okay, so a hippodrome is, is the racetrack, the, the horse racetrack, originally. And in fact, the people, hmm? yeah, so this is the front runner, and, 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 and actually, um, I'm not, not saying that, I should put it this way. This is the, this is the better translation. The forerunner. In other words, he is the person that came ahead of the king to announce that he was coming. And that's how the, the Greeks always call him the prodromos. And if you ever look at any, um, any um, iconography of, of, of John the Baptist, you can always recognize him because he's always got ragged hair and ragged garments. 
And somewhere on there, it'll, it'll say Ioannis Prodromos. And sometimes they write it real weird. It's like if they're writing it in English, it's like, it, it would be like this. And, and, it, and it's like pro dro mos. I don't know why they do it this way, but but it, what will look like a senseless squiggy of, of nonsense is actually a clever way of writing things that shows up all the time on those on those Greek icons. Um, I guess I probably bought pretty much um, digressed this one to death. Okay, so we're, we're still we're still actually talking about the mass. Yeah. All right. So. Uh, okay, we got all the way, we're all the way past the Confidior. Yes, we're flying now. Uh, let's see. Oh, I love it. Then, of course, we, then we have the Gloria. And I love it. Remember, I, the, the kids jump all over this stuff because, you know, it, during the school year, we go through the whole Bible in order. By the time we're talking about the Mass, the kids have gone all the way through both Testaments. And the first thing that starts, the Gloria. Glory to God in the highest and on earth, peace to people of goodwill. Where's that from? Yeah, yeah, no accident. Now, when the church puts these things in here, it, it's wanting you to reflect on the original context while you're at Mass. And I know these things fly by and it's hard, but it's remember, it's like the announcement, it's like the, the, the angel saying, God is here, and God is here physically and in a new way. And it's the same thing that's going to happen at church. God is going to be here physically and in a new way. Um, and then so we go on down, and we're not going to have to read all that. And then this next line, Lord Jesus Christ, only begotten Son. Remember, remember who is the first only begotten Son that's mentioned in the Bible? Ooh, Isaac. Isaac. Yeah, and remember, Isaac was his father fully, Abraham fully intended to sacrifice Isaac. God didn't require it because he, Abraham acted in faith right up to where he's going to kill him before the angel held his hand back. So again, it's saying, Lord Jesus Christ, only begotten Son. Remember, in this way, it's saying that, that Jesus is, is it, what's going on at the Mass is thematically connected to Abraham's sacrifice. And then we say, Lord God, Lamb of God, you take away the sins of the world. Who said that? John the Baptist. John the Baptist said it at the Jordan River. He yelled it out loud and pointed right at Jesus. Behold the Lamb of God. What? Okay, nobody understood him. He's making a prophecy. Y'all pay attention. That's what John the Baptist, next thing out of his mouth. Yes. So this is this is a, a, a way of anticipating anticipating that Jesus is the Paschal Lamb of the New Covenant, and we go down with all the other things, and we don't have time for that. All right. Now, after we have said the, the Gloria, um, let's see. At this point, we're standing. What do we do now? We sit. Don't we sit? No, Colin. Hmm. Colin. That's right. We pray a little bit, and then we sit. And I I can't remember whatever they, they say at the Colin anymore. Um, so, we have the first reading. Most of the time, the first reading is from, is from, and this is when the liturgy of the word first officially begins. Everything prior to that was kind of like the greeting and going through some preparatory processes to kind of put ourselves in the, in the state of mind for paying, paying good attention and letting go of the troubles that we have in the world outside the doors of the church, which is difficult. Anyway, so then we have the first reading is usually from the Old Testament, and it's usually, it's, Letters. Yeah, it's from the Old Testament. Mm -hmm. what? Letters of St. Paul. Oh, that's going to be the second reading. I think there, 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 there are occasions when, when, when the normal rules break down about what the order is, but, but we, don't, we don't have time for exceptions tonight. Okay, so the normal, normally the first reading is from the Old Testament. Yeah, all right. And then the next thing we do is what? The song. Yeah, we do a song, and we sing it. And we yes. sing it just like King David, because among other things... Is that this is oh you know anything any word that's that weird looking you can bet it you can just guarantee that's Greek. <laughs> um, all strange words are Greek. It's like prodromos, Greek. Got to be hippodrome. Too weird to be anything but Greek. Um, yeah. So anyway, psalm actually comes from um, the Greek word to like play a stringed instrument. So that's the way that we it's it's in, in the nature of the psalm by its very name is to say is these things were meant to be sung. And I always love it in a Catholic church because. If, if, if the Catholic Church is on the ball about the Psalms, they're sung. I know on a weekday, you know, you don't have time for all that because we need some help. But it's like just this glorious thing. I always imagine when we sing the Psalms is, wow, this is just like King David. It's so cool. 2,800 years ago, whenever King David was, had written these things, and we're still singing them. It's just wonderful. Now, usually one of the nice things I love about the Catholic Church, too, is y'all know, um, you know we have the reading cycle. Everybody knows about that probably. But everybody in YouTube land might not. 
Um, in the Catholic Church, the priest, the priest cannot just sit there and just read what he wants to every Sunday. You know, if the priest loves Christmas, he can't just say, we're going to read from about Christmas again today. <laughs> no, no, you can't do that. In the Catholic Church, you have a reading cycle, A, B, and C, three years, and, and, and everything, every Catholic Church all around the world on any given Sunday or any given day in the week, unless they have some reason to, to not do it, they should be reading from the pres prescribed readings for that day or that Sunday. And they all hold together. And over a three-year period, I think something like 17% of the Bible is read out loud. Of course, hearing the Bible isn't the same as listening, and it's not the same as understanding either. Um, so I know most of Catholics say, we, we, we hear the, I don't need to read the Bible. I hear the Bible read to me at Mass all the time. And it's like, well, having stuff read to you isn't the same as reading it yourself, you know? That's why the church says, you're supposed to read the Bible. And ever since Vatican II, they're just saying, y'all are supposed to read the Bible. Listening to it in church isn't enough. So, the other nice thing about the readings is that they normally tie together. And that's always one of the fun things we, we get going with the kids. Um, let me see, I think I had, I had a couple little examples in here that were just such a hoot. Oh, there's that picture. Well, no time for that. Put that on the floor. Um, let's see. Oh, these, these. Okay, like for example, um, if, if, we, um, if, if the first reading were from Isaiah, and it said something about, oh, behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and I asked the kids, what kind of a reading would you expect from the gospel? And I say, Ooh, when, when Mary, is, when Mary has, the, is, has announced that she's going to be having the baby, I said, yeah, that's how these things work. They all hold together. And this is one that just kind of confected, just because I'm always loving, always love to harp on the value of works. But for example, if, if the church just wanted to emphasize on a given Sunday something about works, they could do something like this. We'd have the first reading from Proverbs, and you can say that where it says, God will know what you do, whether other people do, and he will repay you according to your works. And then for the psalm, we could have uh, Psalm 62. Power belongs to the Lord, so does kindness, and you reward each of us according to our works. And then for the, uh, the second reading, which we'll be getting to, is the second reading is almost always what? Letters. Yeah, letters for Paul. And oh, let's get on fire up on another strange looking word. Epistolos. And, and, and what that means is, is a letter in the sense of you writing a brief and sending that to somebody. Uh, I think in English we have the, 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 um, the adjective epistolary, which, which I think is, refers to, say, like the, when, when, when historically great authors have sent fabulous letters back and forth between each other, and that would be like an epistolary dialogue or something. But epistolos just means a letter. So Paul wrote those letters. And in this case, it would be something like this from Paul's second reading from Paul's letter to the Romans. God will reward every man according to his works. <laughs> to those who by perseverance in good works seek for glory and honor and immortality, he will give eternal life. I just love that. It's so buck naked. If you, if you persevere in good works and seek for glory and honor and immortality, I mean, it's like saying, someone come to me and say, Christian, are you doing good works in order to seek glory and honor and immortality? Oh, oh no, no. I, I would never do anything that's so prideful. And yet, you know, here's, here's Paul just blatting it right out. Uh, you get, get persevere in those good works, buddy, if you're seeking for glory and honor and immortality, it gets itself some eternal life. And then for the gospel reading, this is typical. Jesus says, for the Son of Man shall come in the glory of his Father with the angels. And of course, that's a riff on Daniel. And then he shall reward every man according to his works. Yeah. So, class, can, can anyone answer this question? Will you be rewarded according to your works? Yes. Yes, you will. Yes, you will. All right. Now, um... Actually, there's other fun. You could ask them. No, no, no. I'm not. I'm not. I'm not saying anything. All right. Um, I, okay. So at this point, let's say that, that those are our readings. And and after we got to the end of the of the second reading, then uh, we're sitting down. And then what do we do next, posture wise? Stand up. Yeah. Why are we going to stand up? Yeah, why do we stand up when we hear the gospel? The reverence. The word yeah, the yeah. reverence. It's a physical, your, your body your body and your soul are coordinated, and this is a moment of greater respect because this is actually about the life of Jesus Christ. Yeah. And you may notice during, during all these 12, 12 weeks, and it's the same thing during the whole year of Sunday school, it's like I must never, ever get around to the epistles because they just lack all the narrative drama of 
love the, the Gospels. The Gospels are, like, Gospels are like, oh, fabulous story, fabulous story, fabulous story. It just never stops. Oh, another fabulous story. Who knew? And then you get to, the, and then you get to Paul and it's like, <laughs> um, but remember, but remember he, he was standing on Jesus' shoulders. So he's not obliged to tell a lot of stories. Anyway, so we get to the end of the first part of the Mass there. Oh, by the oh, I forgot to mention the dromedary. A dromedary camel is called a dromedary. Why do you think? What would characterize a dromedary camel? One hopper. No, no, no. Why would they call him a dromedary? You remember what dromos means? It means he's fast. A fast camel is a dromedary. Yeah. Is get where you're going probably before you before you run out of water, something like that. Anyway, so that's the first half of the Mass, which is pretty much what has gone on um, in, in, um, with the Word for probably 2,500 years or something like that. Now the Mass changes quite a bit. Ooh, now I have to draw a picture. I hate this eraser. I don't know why, why it's there. All right, here we go. A little picture, it helps. Uh, I never draw a typical Catholic church from like the early Christian era. Why not? No reason not to. All right, that was easy. All right, this is this is kind of typical of the church of that day. All right, and this is called a basilica plan. And this plan was inherited from um, Roman civil courts and things like that. So this would be kind of like a kind of a courthousey sort of thing. Some of them were like this actually. They would actually have, an, that, that, that curved thing is called an apse. They would have an apse at both ends, and court would take place here, and in between you'd have columns like this. And, um, and then people would go about their legal business in here before it was their turn for a case or whatever they wanted done, and then there was a little bit of space to circulate and so forth and so on. Anyway, so basically what happens in the Catholic Church is, is the first thing that happens is you get a different magic marker. These are red ones. All right. If you're going to have a service that does not involve sacrifice, all you need is a place where people can sit down and have the word read to them and sing hymns and sing songs and have someone with authority comment upon the readings and then you can go home. That's all you would need. You could get by. That's all. What were you going to do in church? That would be enough. That would be enough for you. This is the. This would be the liturgy of the word. This is what you would need architecturally. But in the Catholic Church, that's just the first half of the service. Second half of the service is the sacrifice, which has a separate part. Now. And the sacrifice is going to be here, and it's what the liturgy of the Eucharist. All right. Two different parts for two different things, but they're happening in the same building, one right after the other. So here it is. This, this is for the book. This was for the blood. The whole thing is for both. And it's interesting in the Catholic Church is that usually, and this goes all the way back to the meeting tent, does that remember the meeting tent was all surrounded by an outer court, and the meeting tent was in here. And you could come in that far, and that was it. Levites could come in that far, and that was it. The high priest could call all the way over here. And that's where God's presence would tootle down from heaven and hover. And all that restricted access to, you start out here, and the more you go this way, the holier things get. And you go far enough, and the things jump off into heaven. It's the same thing in this Catholic church. People can... They, they, First, was everybody's on the outside. Then, presumably, the faithful or the people who are in the process of becoming faithful as the catechumens can come in and they're free to, 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 to sit in however they want in here. But that's as far as they go. And then, this is where the equivalent of the ministerial Levite priests are. And then, in this case, over here we had the high priest was in here. In this case, the high priest is kind of actually here as... as as a, thing, as a sacrificial victim, but he's also up in heaven offering himself up before the Father at the same time. And that's why we tend to, at a very minimum, a Catholic church, 
we have steps here in order to demarcate 